talk about a joint work with Ian Melbourne, who I guess you all know. So Ian is an ergodic person and I'm more of a stochastic person, so this project required the best of both our abilities. So you may have seen Ian give this talk previously and it would have been more on the ergodic theory side. I'm going to give you uh, the stochastic theory side, which requires rough path theory, which we've just heard about. So I'll go into detail about how you can apply rough path theory to fast slow systems. So what I'm, the type of fast slow system I'll be talking about is of the following form. So you have a couple set of ODEs where they, the X variables are slow and the Y variables are fast. The X variables are slow because when the y variable changes and makes changes of order one, the x variable only makes changes of order epsilon. So epsilon is some small parameter. We're going to assume that the fast y dynamics, so it's deterministic, it satisfies some sort of ODE, it's a flow. We're going to assume that it's mildly chaotic on some state space lambda, or probably I should call that m. Pretend this is an m and has some ergodic invariant measure mu. So mildly chaotic sounds like it might be a real definition. It's not, it's just what I'm using to say not necessarily very chaotic. So chaotic, known to be chaotic, but not with very strong mixing properties. So the actual assumptions that, I'm, that we're going to make on Y will become apparent as I go on. We're also going to assume, so here I'm just telling you what space everything lives in. So this is just saying the y variables live on some manifold and the x variables live in Euclidean space, Rn. This assumption here is called the centering assumption, which I'll explain to you in a second. So our aim is to try and find some kind of reduced equation for x. So an approximation for the slow variables that doesn't depend on y at all. So you've eliminated the y variables from the equation, and the approximation gets better as epsilon gets smaller. So what we're going to do is we're going to try and see this effective x behavior by looking at large time scales. So we're going to rescale to time scales of order 1 over epsilon squared. So I just want to tell you how this fits into the other types of uh, limit theorems we've already seen. So we've seen an averaging result. This is chalk. So an averaging result would be if I looked at time scales of order 1 over epsilon. So if I went back to these original equations and I looked at time scales of order 1 over epsilon, the averaged equation would be something like it would be a deterministic ODE where the effective vector field is just the average version of this H that appears here. And the F would not play any role. It's kind of too small to play any role. So the averaged H would be exactly this. You just average against the invariant measure of the fast dynamics. So by making this centering assumption, we're saying that we're going to look at the fluctuations about this average. But this is different to a central limit theorem because central limit theorem is looking at the fluctuations on this time scale. What we're doing is looking at the fluctuations on a much larger time scale. So in some sense, we're waiting for the fluctuations to pile up and give you order one deviations rather than just order epsilon to the half deviations. So if you, ever, if, you, if you wanted to know how fluctuations sort of allow you to escape a well or something like that, you need to look at much larger time scales. So looking at this type of time scale would, is often called a homogenization problem. So in setting up fast slow, slow systems, this you'd call averaging 
And then these fluctuations you'd call homogenization. In other, for PDE settings, homogenization and averaging basically mean the exact same thing. But in the setting of fast, slow systems, they often mean different things. So by looking at this type of rescaled equation, we're really trying to pick up the order one fluctuations. OK, so if we were to simulate uh, this system and just look at what the x variable looks like. So I'll just give you a picture in one dimension. So if we simulate it for one fixed choice of initial condition of both x and y, you get something like this. So you get something that looks like a trajectory of an SDE, even though everything's completely deterministic. Now if you did another simulation with the same x initial condition, but a different y initial condition, so you start from the same place here because you use the same x initial condition, you get something that essentially looks like a different realization of the same SDE. So it looks like you've just picked a different random seed for the same equation. So they won't necessarily overlap on each other. That's just kind of to indicate they have the same average behavior with different fluctuations. So if we want to try and characterize the, be the limiting behavior of these x variables, it seems from a simulation, well, a blackboard simulation, that the limit is some kind of SDE, and the randomness from the SDE is coming from the initial condition in the y variables. So if we want to try to characterize this limit, we should turn x epsilon into a random variable by assuming that the initial condition of the fast variables is distributed like the invariant measure. So you started in stationarity, that turns everything into a random variable. Now we can ask the question, this random variable x epsilon, does it converge to an SDE? So the law of this random path, does it converge to the law of an SDE? That's the question we're asking. So the aim is to characterize the distribution or the law of this random path x epsilon as epsilon goes to zero. So to give you an idea how this works, we're going to look at a simplified version of the original fast flow system. So in the original system, you cannot separate, so nothing is separated here. The vector fields in the slow variables depend on both x and y. So I'm going to assume that you can separate the dependence in this term. And I'm also going to assume here that this term doesn't depend on the fast variables at all. So it's, it's just an assumption that makes the ideas a lot cleaner. So now, once we've made this assumption, so we've separated this variable into a matrix times a vector field. So there's some intermediate space so V maps the fast dynamics into some intermediate space RD, or sorry, RN, and then H maps that intermediate space into the state space of the slow variables. And now the centering assumption is really just on the part containing Y. So you factorize the X dependence out. So it's kind of easy to see where the SDE comes out of this. So if I define a path w epsilon of t to be this integral, so the integral of v of y epsilon with this epsilon inverse there, then it's pretty easy to see if you write down the integral version of this ODE, you get exactly this integral equation, where I've used I've used the Riemann Stilcher's interpretation of what DW, what a DW integral means. Because here W epsilon is completely smooth for every choice of epsilon. So there's only one notion, there's only one way that you can interpret what this integral means, and it's just you replace DW with W dot DS. So it's pretty clear, it's pretty easy to see that if you make that transformation, you get exactly this ODE. Okay, so it looks like an SDE. Of course, the only reason it looks like an SD is because I've called this W. So I should give you a better justification for why this is actually an SD. So why is W epsilon an approximation of Brownian motion? So 
a simple but not necessarily correct way to see it is to write w epsilon. So remember, we started off uh, we started off in an order one scaling, and then we looked at large times. So now, if I take the w epsilon definition and go back to the original order one scaling, so I undo that large time rescaling, and w epsilon turns into something like this, where now the y dynamics don't depend on epsilon at all. Then I can cut up this integral into chunks of size one, so it's time steps of size one. So it's easy, to, well, it's believable that if the fast dynamics are chaotic, then these random variables, so these integrals here are random variables because the initial condition of the y is a random variable. So if, if y is chaotic, it's believable that there should be some kind of decay of correlations in these random variables. You're forgetting about your initial conditions, so it makes sense. That so this isn't the true. This isn't true. What I'm saying, it's just giving an idea of why you should believe this behaves like Brownian motion. So it's believable that the terms that appear in this sum, these random variables, might have some kind of decay of correlations. If they do have some kind of decay of correlations, then we have exactly a central limit theorem type sum. So we've got the central limit theorem scaling here, or really a Donska invariance principle scaling. And we have random variables that are centered because of our centering condition and with some, some kind of decay of correlations. So for very general classes of Y, it is known not for this reason, but for a related reason that these approximations W epsilon do indeed converge to Brownian motion. Someone say something? Right. So for very general classes of chaotic Y, it is indeed known that W epsilon does converge to Brownian motion in a supernorm topology where W oh, is a multiple of Brownian motion and the covariance is computed in the usual way from the covariance of the fast dynamics. So this is getting to the idea of what we call mildly chaotic. So any kinds of assumptions on why that, that give you this kind of invariance principle, this is getting to the idea of what kind of assumptions we're putting on the fast dynamics. So I don't want to go into any details about the types of assumptions we're making, but suffice it to say, we're considering the types of fast systems where this happens. So this is, this is weak convergence, so this is the law of this random path converges to the Wiener measure, so it's definitely weak convergence. Because it's a random variable on path space, so you need to endow that path space with a topology. So but weak convergence means continuous functionals of the random variable converge to the corresponding continuous functionals, so you need to say what continuous means. So the soup norm just says what continuous means. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Okay, so now we at least believe that W epsilon deserves the name W. It is acting as some kind of approximation of Brownian motion. So if it is, then it makes sense that the limiting behavior of this integral equation should be some kind of SDE. So if we just, maybe we can just replace W epsilon with the limit, and that should be our limit of X bar. So we can define X bar as this stochastic differential equation. So the question is, what does this mean? So you can't use this rule anymore because Brownian motion is not differentiable. Brownian motion is nowhere differentiable. So you have to be more specific about what you mean by the integral against DW. So how should we interpret this integral? Should, is it a Stratonovich integral? Is it an Ito integral? Or is it neither? So we saw in Peter's talk that sometimes you'll get Stratonovich. So in the case of these reversible uh, fast slow systems that were over here, you would get Stratonovich. In the case of physical Brownian motion, you shouldn't expect Stratonovich. So we don't really know what to expect here. The natural guess is Stratonovich. 
So it's thought that any, when noise arises as a limit of a smooth signal, you should get Stratonovich. It's an incorrect intuition, but it is an intuition that most people have. So, so the question is, how can we figure out how you should interpret this integral? So in the additive noise case, the answer is simple. So additive noise is when you assume the coefficient of W epsilon is just the identity. So to explain why it's simple, consider this kind of abstract setting. So suppose you have an integral equation driven by an additive noise where your noise is just some uniformly continuous part U. So it's a result due to Sussman from the 70s that this equation is well defined and moreover, so you can make sense of the solution to this equation, and moreover, the map from the, solution, from the noise U to the solution X is continuous in the supernorm topology. So it's kind of obvious that this works in the additive noise case because with additive noise, this is really just a perturbation of an ODE. So that's not really a result to say that this is continuous as a function of U because that's just Gronwall's inequality. Uh, the, the guts of the result is that this actually works in, in a multiplicative noise case but only when u is one-dimensional. So the result of Sussman is that you can construct a solution map to this equation in the, multi in the multiplicative noise case, but only in the case where u is one-dimensional. And that solution map is continuous, but only in the case where u is one-dimensional. This is completely deterministic. It's a, it's a deterministic construction where the only input is a single fixed path of U. So wh when I say noisy, I don't necessarily mean random, I just mean not very regular. So this result was used by Ian and Andrew Stewart a few years back. So if the flow is mildly chaotic, so you know that W epsilon converges weakly to Brownian motion, then you can use this continuity result of Sussman to lift the convergence to the slow, to the slow variables. So it's known that if you have convergence, if you have weak convergence of a random variable, then continuous functions of that random variable also converge to continuous function, the continuous function of the limit. So continuous functions preserve weak convergence. So that's precisely the fact we're going to use here. We're going to use the fact that this solution map phi is continuous to lift an invariance principle on the noise to an invariance principle on the solution. So this is what Ian and Andrew did. As an assumption, so if the flow is chaotic enough so that you have an invariance principle, you have a weak convergence of W epsilon to Brownian motion, then you can lift it to the solution using the fact that the solution map is continuous. In the case where it's additive noise, the answer is, well, there's, there's no choice because there's only one way to determine, to identify the integral of dW against 1. It's just W. So it doesn't matter how you define a notion of integration here. They're all the same. In the multiplicative 1D noise case, the limit is Stratonovich. So this is kind of a consequence of the Sussman construction. So Sussman built this map on uniformly continuous paths it turns out that if you plug white noise into that map, you always end up with Stratonovich. So in the multiplicative 1D noise case, the limit is always Stratonovich. So the basic strategy is, so you want to find, you want, you want to build a solution map some, from some kind of irregular path space. So a path space that includes things like Brownian motion to a solution space. So in the Sussman case, this was really just a map from W epsilon to X epsilon. And if, this, if we know this map is continuous, then we can lift our invariance principle on W epsilon to an invariance principle on X epsilon. So unfortunately, when the noise is both multidimensional and multiplicative, this strategy goes badly wrong. So as Peter indicated in that diagram, this map is not continuous at all. 
you need to add extra information to make it continuous. So I'll just give you a brief idea in, as to why it's not continuous. So the, the basic idea is that SDEs are extremely sensitive to approximations of noise. So suppose you had some kind of SDE, say it's in Ito form, it doesn't really matter, and now define an approximation of this equation just by approximating the Brownian motion in some way. So it turns out that if you try to undo this approximation, you can end up to a different place from where you started quite easily. So Xn, if you define Xn just by approximating the Wn, and then you take the approximation away, you take n to infinity, xn might converge to something completely different to what you started off with. It all depends on how you approximate the Brownian motion. So the two canonical examples of this are Ito and Stratonovich. So if you approximated this with a step function, so you took your Brownian motion, you, cut it, you replaced it with step functions on some grid, and then took your grid size away, then you would get back to the original equation. Well, you'd get back to Ito. So if you started off in Ito, you'd get back to Ito. So this is kind of how you define Ito integration in some sense. On the other hand, if you replaced, if you approximated Wn with a linear interpolation of Brownian motion, then you'd converge to something else. You converge to the Stratonovich SDE. So this is known as Wong Sakai theorem. So you can always write a Stratonovich integral in terms of an Ito integral plus a correction. So effectively, the difference, that, the difference between these two limits is a term that appears here in the drift. So you get an additional drift term. So it really would change the qualitative behavior of the solution a lot. So usually the story ends here. And people just think there's Ito and Stratonovich. But actually, there's infinitely many things more. So McShane constructed a two by two example uh, where you can end up with an integral which is neither Ito nor Stratonovich. And Sussman constructed arbitrary examples which show that you can, basic, you can get more or less any correction from a, a pretty big class of corrections by interpolating your Brownian motion in the right way. So if instead of using a linear interpolation, you use some kind of higher order spline interpolation of the Brownian motion. You can get limits which are neither Ito nor Stratonovich. So in summary, this is not continuous. The map from noise to solution is not continuous because it's extremely sensitive to how you approximate the noise. If it was continuous, it wouldn't matter how you approximate the noise. The only thing that would matter is the limit. But here, it's more than just the limit that matters. So it's not enough just to know what the limit is. So it's not even if you ask, for example, that the approximation, the path that you use approximation is smooth in some sense. It's not yes, that, then there'd be no problem. So uh, it, if, if, you, if you knew that your path W was in a class of smooth paths, then yeah, you definitely have theorem, continuity theorems. It's just when you want to be in a space that you know contains noisy paths like Brownian motion, so your topology is a lot weaker. That's when that map is not continuous anymore. But it wouldn't converge in a smooth topology because the limit is not smooth. Yeah, yeah I mean, this is, a, this is a piecewise smooth approximation. So the second two are both piecewise smooth approximations. And they give you all kinds of different answers. Yes, we have, we have a very particular way of approximating. It's a very strange interpolation where you interpolate by doing a flow. Well, and not, not strange, but it's strange from this perspective, but from a physical perspective, it's very natural. Okay, so it's not enough just to know that Wn converges to Brownian motion. We need more information. So the more information is where rough path theory comes into the picture. So rough path theory provides a unified definition of a differential equation driven by a noisy path. And by unified, I mean that it accounts for all different notions of integration at the same time. It treats them all equally under one roof. So it, it 
it gives meaning to an equation driven by some kind of noisy part u when the integral against du is not well defined in the sense it might have many meanings. So as Peter illustrated, in addition to just knowing the driving path u, you must be given an additional path, bold face u, which is a matrix valued path, which is formally the iterated integral of the path u. So there's some, there's some situations where there's only there's one natural choice for what this iterated integral is. For instance, if u was smooth, there's only one way that you would define this. There's other situations where there's a lot of different ways to define this, and you need to pick one. You need to make it a prescribed part of your problem. So choosing, u, choosing boldface u here tells you how you should interpret what this equation means. So the extra components, the extra parts of the problem, tell us how we should interpret the method of integration. So just to illustrate that point, so if you are given a rough path, so a rough path is the pair u and boldface u, then you can construct a solution to this rough differential equation. And as Peter illustrated, it's, it's some kind of compensated Riemann sum. So you figure out how you should define this kind of stochastic integral as a higher order Riemann sum, and then you just build fixed point arguments based on that integral. So for example, if u was Brownian motion and you prescribed that boldface u was the, iter the Ito integral of that Brownian motion, then the x you construct would be precisely the solution to the Ito SDE. On the other hand, if u was Brownian motion and your boldface u was the Stratonovich integral of Brownian motion, then the x that you construct would be the Stratonovich solution to this SDE. So in some sense, the choice of this iterated integral is telling you what the choice of this integral in here is. So the most important properties of this construction, so the construction of from a rough path to a solution, so first it's an extension of the classical solution map. So this means if you were in the case where u was actually smooth, so the, if u was smooth then boldface u has one natural definition, which is just the actual integral, the Riemann Stilch's integral, then the solution you build here agrees with the classical solution, because if everything's smooth, it's just an ODE and it has a classical solution. So it's an ex the solution map is an extension of the classical solution. And moreover, it's continuous, and it's continuous with this rough path topology, which Peter talked about. So it's some kind of extension of a holder topology. So and it's a topology which allows for paths that are not particularly smooth, paths like Brownian motion. So if we return to the slow variables, uh, so we'll see how we're going to use this rough path framework. So we write down our slow variables. So this was the in integral version of that equation. So you can see it looks exactly like these rough path equations I was talking about, where W epsilon is playing the role of U. So this means... We need another piece of input, which is boldface w epsilon. So in this case, because for each fixed epsilon, w epsilon is smooth, there's really no choice about how you should define this integral. It's defined canonically for each epsilon. So we simply define boldface w epsilon to be the riemann stilchers integral of w epsilon against w epsilon. Because we know this solution map phi, is an extension of the classical solution. That means when we plug in w epsilon and boldface w epsilon into this rough path map, we get the classical solution. So the solution to this integral equation is exactly what you build from your rough path map. Because we know it's continuous, this means we can lift w epsilon, boldface w epsilon. So if we knew, if we had a limit theorem for this pair, then we could lift it to a limit theorem for the slow variables. And the limiting equation is just, so it'll be phi of the limiting rough path. So as an extra part of the problem, you need to figure out how you should interpret this rough differential equation as a stochastic differential equation. So for instance, if we knew, so we already know that this is going to converge to Brownian motion. If we knew that W epsilon converged to a Stratonovich iterated integral, 
then we know that the integral appearing here would be Stratonovich. So that's how this rough path framework works. So the first result, if the fast dynamics are mildly chaotic, so whatever that means, then we can prove that the pair converges to a limiting pair where W is a Brownian motion and boldface W, so we write it in this form first, we write it as an Ito integral plus some correction where the integral is of Ito type and the correction is formally given by an expression like this. Sorry? It only converges to Brownian motion, you say. Oh, the, the assumptions are more than it will just converge. So, it's, yeah. So, you'll notice here that I have inverted commas around these equal signs. So, actually, the assumption, the types of assumptions that we we make on the fast process, don't tell you that these integrals are actually finite. So. In the situation where these integrals are not finite, we have more complicated expressions for them, but finite expressions. And in the situations where you know these integrals actually exist, then our corrections are equal to them. So if you know that the right-hand side exists, then they're equal. If you don't know this exists, then you have a different expression for this. So to, it, to, to know that this integral exists means that you'd have, you need to have some kind of control of the decay of correlations of the flow, and that's not the kind of thing that we assume. So we, we don't a priori know that this integral exists. But in the case where you assume it exists, then our, our correction is that. No, l lambda is always finite. So this, this, this integral might not be finite. So in the case, if there is a situation where this is not finite, then they're not equal. This is equal to something else which is finite. So as a direct corollary, so as soon as we plug this into the rough path framework, so under the same assumptions as above, the slow dynamics converge to x bar where x bar satisfies this limiting ST. So the general rule is you write your, to figure out how you should interpret your stochastic integral, you write it as, for instance, Ito integral plus a correction. And in your limiting equation, you'll have Ito integral plus a correction. And the correction shows up in the exact way that a Stratonovich, an Ito Stratonovich correction would show up. Might be missing a half there or something. So here we've written it in Ito form. So I, I told you that most people would expect this is Stratonovich and that they're wrong. So it's not clear that this isn't Stratonovich because this correction might be exactly the Ito Stratonovich correction. But just for your sake, I'll write it in Stratonovich form. So if you change to Stratonovich form, so you write, just change this from an Ito to a Stratonovich integral, and you get a slightly different correction, and it's non-zero. So essentially, you end up with the anti-symmetric part of this integrated autocorrelation operator with the same disclaimer that they're only equal when the right-hand side is actually finite. OK, so I want to give you some idea as to how this theorem works. So th this is really a direct corollary. This is the main result. Oh, wrong way. So the strategy is that we're going to try and decompose this W epsilon path into two parts. The first part is what's called a good martingale sequence, so with the epsilon indexing the sequence. So a good martingale is something for which, so if you have a pair of semi-martingales, so it's really a a good semi-martingale is the definition. So a good semi-martingale is one which, if you define an integral in terms of 
if you define a sequence of Ito integrals and you take a limit, they remain Ito integrals. So if you know you have a pair of semi martin girls, u epsilon and m epsilon with some limit, and then you look at the stochastic integral, or how does m epsilon behave as an integrator, you know that it always converges to the Ito integral, where all of the integrals are the Ito type. So if you start with Ito, you take a limit, you stay in Ito. So this type of martingale is called a good martingale. And not all martingales are of that type. Some, of, some martingales are not good. So we're going to decompose W epsilon into a martingale part plus some correction A epsilon. So A epsilon will converge to zero uniformly but oscillate rapidly. So in this sense, uh, it's, it's like a corrector. So for the stochastic homogenization PDE people, this A epsilon is really playing the role of a corrector, something that doesn't play any role because it vanishes, but it accounts for all the highly oscillatory parts in your limit theorem. So the basic idea, I'll draw a little picture. So I gave you a sort of nonsense explanation for why you should believe W epsilon behaves like Brownian motion. There's a less nonsense idea. So you don't want to cut up your integral into chunks of size one. You want to be a bit smarter about it. So actually, you want to introduce a Poincaré section into your Y space. So a Poincaré section is just some set going through your space. And then you run your flow. So say this is your y is 0. You run your flow, and you wait until it comes back to that section. And the place where it lands, this is t of y 0, and this is your Poincaré map. So you keep doing this. That'll be t squared of y 0, etc. So this here is our Poincaré section. So we introduce a Poincaré section with a Poincaré map t and return times tau j. So the return times is basically how long you have to wait for the jth return. So how, 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 long do you, how, long, how much time does this orbit take? So we're going to split up our integral in that way instead. So you cut it up into these orbits. So you can see, so the first step, all I've done is cut it up and then uh, so I was, I'm kind of ignoring the last little bit of the sum, so there might be some little bit where you haven't quite returned yet. So just assume that you end exactly on the section, and this n of epsilon inverse t is how many times you have returned. So now you can write this integral here as actually one observable just of... So if you imagine what this integral is doing, it's saying take a point uh, here and integrate it along your flow until you return. So actually, this, is an, this observable is just a function of this random variable. So you can write this integral just as an observable of this random variable, which is essentially what I'm doing here. So this v tilde is really a more complicated observable of just where you are in the Poincaré section. So that term that appears in the sum, I'll just call vj. So in this setup, it's much more believable that you will have decay of correlations for these random variables. So if you choose the Poincaré section in the right way for very general classes of flows, you do have decay of correlations. So it's much more believable that you will have a central limit theorem for this type if you decompose the sum in this way. So now you're starting to see what I mean by weakly or mildly chaotic. So what we have is a central limit theorem type sum for a stationary random sequence, Vj. The sequence has a natural filtration, which is... So you take the sigma algebra associated with the original y0 probability space, and you just look at inverse images of it. So that's the natural filtration for which these random variables will be measurable. 
So next, what you do is a martingale approximation. So a martingale approximation is a nice idea that so if we knew that these VJs was a martingale difference sequence, then we'd be able to use a martingale central limit theorem to figure out to show that W epsilon converges to W. So the approach of Gordan was to so in the case where you don't know it's a martingale sequence, try to decompose it into a martingale plot plus something which vanishes in the limit. So we're going to try to use a martingale approximation to show that this central limit theorem type sum converges to Brownian motion. So I've just used this shorthand n epsilon for that, the number of returns you make. So what you do is you take each of these random variables. So the aim is to write vj as mj, where mj is a martingale difference sequence. So its expectation with respect to this natural filtration is zero, plus a term like this. So the point of picking, the point of writing it as zj minus zj plus one is that, well, if you look at, if you sum them all up, it's going to telescope. So you'll have something which is epsilon times something order one, so it'll vanish in the limit. A good choice, if it converges, is this series. So you pick zj to be the sum of these conditional expectations. So it's pretty easy to check that if you plug in this choice here, so all you have to do is check that the expectation of this minus this is zero. And when you take expectation of all these sums, the condition, the condition part of the two becomes the same and they all vanish. Convergence of this series is guaranteed by decay of correlations for the Poincaré map because these random variables decay if Vj plus K becomes less correlated with the filtration of Fj. So you might have seen this kind of idea applied to Markov processes. It's really the exact same idea. So the good martingale is this M part of the decomposition. So M epsilon, which was just the sum of the M part. And the corrector is what you get when you plug the Zj minus Zj plus 1 and let it telescope. So all you end up with is epsilon Z0 minus Zn epsilon minus 1. So you can see that this is doing, the corrector is doing what we want it to. It's, it's going to vanish as epsilon goes to zero. So it's not going to contribute at all to this approximation of the Brownian motion. However, it is oscillating extremely rapidly because it's a function of epsilon to the minus 2t. So now if we write W epsilon in terms of this decomposition, so using the fact that M is a good martingale difference sequence, so uh, good martingales were defined by Kurtz and Prodder, and they have a very nice condition that allows you to check when a martingale is good. It essentially says, so for, in the case of a pure martingale, it essentially says that the quadratic variation is bounded uniformly in the index of the sequence. So in this case, we have to check that the quadratic variation is bounded uniformly in epsilon. And it is, the quadratic variation is basically just the covariance. It doesn't depend on epsilon. So it's simple to check that this is a good martingale and that, well, we know that this is small because it's small. So that means, well, you don't actually need the fact that this is a good martingale to get this convergence statement. You just need the fact that it's a martingale different sequence. You use the martingale central limit theorem to tell you that W epsilon converges to the Brownian motion plus what the corrector converges to, which is zero. Okay, so all, we, all we've used is Martingale central limit theorem and boundedness of Z, which is another consequence of decay of correlations for this Poincaré map. So as a disclaimer, I've swept a whole lot under the rug here to make it the idea a bit nicer. So this is an interesting kind of Martingale. Well, it's an interesting kind of filtration because it's actually going backwards. The filtration gets smaller in time, which is kind of obvious because you're observing the same random variable just under a different observable. So you're not gaining any information as you go forward in time. So actually, none of these constructions are rigorous because we need to... So this is not a martingale because a martingale requires that a filtration gets bigger rather than smaller. So what you really have to do is reverse these sums. 
So consider the Martin girl going backwards in time. So I won't tell you about that. It makes things a lot more technical, but the basic idea is the same. So finally, so now we're going to use the fact that this wasn't just a martingale, it was a good martingale. So to compute this iterated integral, we decompose it into these two parts. So, well, four parts. So the m part, the ma, the am, and the aa. So since m epsilon is a good martingale, so in this statement here, I have to be a little bit careful about what I mean by integrals. On the left-hand side, there's no trouble about what you mean by an integral. This is always, this can be anything, say it's an Ito integral or whatever. They're always, W epsilon is smooth, so it doesn't matter how you define this. On the right hand side, because of the way I've decomposed this into discontinuous processes, it's not true anymore. They're not smooth, so you actually have to def make sure you know what notion of integration you're talking about here. So really we should say all of these integrals are Ito integrals. Since m epsilon is a good martingale sequence, this means that Ito integrals remain Ito integrals in the limit. So in particular, this integral of m epsilon against m epsilon will converge to the Ito integral of w against w. We also know that the limit of a epsilon against m epsilon will converge to the limit of a against m as an Ito integral. The limit of a is zero, so you can only get zero from that. The other terms don't behave in the same way. So essentially, because a epsilon is oscillating so rapidly, you, you can't expect that this integral will vanish. Even though the path itself vanishes, the integral won't vanish. It's exactly the same idea as this rapidly spinning complex path that Peter gave us in the last talk. So even though you know a epsilon is of order epsilon, the iterated term a epsilon d epsilon doesn't vanish. So it kind of makes sense formally. a epsilon is of order epsilon, but d a epsilon should be like a epsilon dot ds. And a epsilon dot is of order epsilon times 1 over epsilon squared. So actually, from that formal scaling, you get something of order 1 here. So it makes sense that this integral shouldn't vanish. This integral also doesn't vanish, not for that formal reason, but for a different reason. So the last two terms don't vanish, and actually you can compute them as ergodic averages. So the actual computations would be in terms of this Poincaré decomposition we've done. So I don't, I don't want to go into details about what the messy formulas are. So you'd get formulas in terms of this decomposition, and in the case where you know all these integrals are finite, you can rewrite that decomposition in terms of the integrals. So some extensions, so things that I didn't want to bother you with. So in the original fast flow system, when we hadn't separated the variables, uh, it's a bit harder. Essentially, you have to do this in an infinite dimensional setting. So instead of considering just paths, you have to consider function valued paths. So each one of these vector fields essentially behaves as a function valued approximation of a function of an infinite dimensional Brownian motion. But luckily rough paths works just as well in infinite dimensions. And Ishmael Bayer will tell us about an alternative approach to this tomorrow using the idea of rough flows in joint work with Remy Cotelier. So we can also use these ideas to look at discrete time fast flow maps. So the rough path framework is not built to work in discrete time but it's not too hard to adapt it to work in discrete time, as long as, all the, as long as the limits are actually continuous. But, uh, you were explaining that uh, approximation method, so if you start with the discrete time, you, have, you want to go to continuous time, you have to say something about, or maybe you want uh, something, I don't know, you have to say something was happening in the middle, no? So yeah, it's not, it's not trivial at all. I'm just not talking about it. Uh, no, no, there's no arbitrariness. I mean, if you write, if you write down a discrete fast flow system, there's only one limit that it will converge to. So it's essentially the exact same idea. As long as you know what this 
discrete time approximation of Brownian motion will converge to, and you know what a discrete version of this iterated integral will converge to. So a discrete version of the iterated integral will be something like Oh, that interpolation makes absolutely no difference. If you interpolate the solution, they'll all converge to the same thing. It's only when you interpolate the driving path. Yeah. So you can, you can interpolate in any way you want, and th those interpolations won't matter. So, yeah, the second thing that I didn't tell you about was these discrete time results. Uh, some future things that we'd like to work on would be to introduce feedback, but from an ergodic theory perspective, from, from the perspective of uh, proving weak invariance principles, this seems difficult. So introduce feedback into the fast variables. And secondly, stochastic PDE limits. So instead of looking at finite dimensional things, can we consider fast slow PDEs? So this is related to what Etienne described at the end of his talk. You want to take non-Markovian approximations, non-Markovian non homogenizations. Okay. So uh, the work, w this is contained roughly in three papers. So the first is in Annals of Probability. Well, it will appear in Annals of Probability. Uh, the second is where we do this infinite dimensional version to treat the fully uh, non-separated fast flow system. And the third paper is where I adapt the tools of rough path theory to discrete time. And all my slides are on my website. Thank you. So, some questions, comments? Yes. Lucas. No, no, it's. Do you need it? Okay. So, I was just wondering if. In, in dynamics, you have other methods for proving CLT than this Martingale approach. But how essential is that you do the central? The, so I'm wondering if you uh, treat the central limit theorem with some spectral method or something like that. How would you identify this A, this corrector? So the, the, the Martingale approach is convenient because the technology to figure out what the iterated intervals converge to is already there. If there's other methods where you can still have technology that allow you to identify iterated intervals, that would be just as good. So it would depend on what the method is. I, I just wonder how this corrector, uh, this appeared in the Martingale approximation, but does it have some way of identifying it if I do not refer to the Martingale method? Sorry, what was uh, the last part? How would I identify it independently of the Martingale method, this corrector? I'm not sure. Mm. Uh -huh. oh, which, which you mean the A corrector or the lambda correction? The, the A epsilon, the A epsilon you had. I, I don't know if you can interpret it without a martingale decomposition. Uh -huh. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's the same. Interpreting A is the same as interpreting M. You mm -hmm. certainly can't interpret M without the martingale decomposition. Mm -hmm. Comment, remark, further? No? Ah, yes, we said. Um, okay, I'm sorry, it's just out of proximity. No, 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 it's okay. It's okay. Um, when you're doing Markov chains, this uh, uh, Martin approximation, you don't really need that uh, the corrector is bounded. Mm. Uh, it's enough that bounds in L2, and, and in fact, it could be even. Uh, sublinear growing, why, why, why do you need in this context that it's bounded? Uh, you, you, don't, you just need moments. It depends on what you're trying to prove. So it, just central limit here. So, I mean, if you, uh, where's it gone? If, if the only thing you're trying to say is that this converges to uh -huh. Brownian motion, then all you need is that this converges to zero in probability. Yeah, just sublinear growth usually yeah. is enough. So and here, what do you assume? When I said bounded, I didn't. I think we just have moments, right? L2. L2, okay. Yeah. 
So, so maybe, maybe I missed the detail, but did you actually give the precise definition of, of mildly chaotic, no, or w not. would it be too scaring for the audience? So, what was the second bit? Would it be too scaring for the audience? It would be too scary for me. <laughs> <laughs> I think the audience would be much happier with it than I would. This is, this, that's Ian's part of the game. Okay, so maybe you can discuss precise definition later, uh, personally, so, or someone else? No? Well, uh, okay. Uh, I just want to make a quick connection to this physical brown and motion example. So I was a little rushed in the end, but if you remember the dynamics, you can and should, of course, introduce the momentum in this context, just, uh, you know, mass times x dot. And it plays exactly the role of your A here. It's also, yeah, you know, yeah. it goes to zero at the rate square root of m, which you may call epsilon, so it plays a very similar role. Yeah. It goes to zero, but its oscillations are high, and therefore it, they contribute to the iterate integrals to rough pass. So yeah. just to make a connection. And does it play, is, is there a martingale? I mean, I guess you get your martingales for free. Well, we can do explicit Gaussian computations yeah, here, yeah. but, you know, underlying there's a very similar structure. Yeah. So. Okay. Well, maybe we stop here. We are run out of time, so let's thank the speaker again.